Today on Applied Science, we're celebrating an important milestone, over 10 years of making videos and over 250 videos produced. And so I thought in today's episode, it would be fun to take a look at some of the best videos. Now, I know what you're thinking. Ah, he probably just doesn't have anything new. Well, that's actually true, but I'm, I am working on good stuff and there's plenty more to come. Uh, my patrons have actually decided what you'll see next and it's very good. Trust me, it's worth it. Uh, as always, these meta videos will be free for my patrons. So instead of just doing a listicle of like the most viewed videos, I thought it would be most interesting to show you the videos that are most personally relevant to me. This channel has actually shaped large sections of my life, and um, a lot of these videos have backstory that you might find interesting as well. So let's take a look. The first video that I ever uploaded to YouTube shows me pouring liquid oxygen onto a lit barbecue, a charcoal barbecue. And uh, this actually set the tone for a lot of the type of videos that I uploaded. I wanted to show something that had never before been seen on the internet. This is, okay, it's a little bit more than 10 years ago. But when I made this, there was only some photos and maybe an animated GIF of pouring liquid oxygen on a barbecue. And for some reason, I thought this was like, you know, well, it is one of the coolest things ever. And uh, I wanted to get, you know, video documentation of it and show everyone what this really looks like. And that's actually kind of the genesis of the entire channel, is just showing really cool stuff that you just can't see anywhere else. I'm going to go through these videos chronologically, uh, just for, to give some consistency here. And so soon after the liquid oxygen, you might be surprised that the next video I uploaded was a short series on making cakes. And um, for a long time, this was actually my most viewed video. For years and years afterwards, the cake making videos were by far the most popular. And even though it seems orthogonal, it was actually in the same vein, right? Like there's just not that much information at the time, this is 10 years ago, on the internet about how to make these fancy fondant sort of decorated cakes. And I would always see these things in magazine articles and stuff and thought, well, it doesn't you know, seem too hard, but the, the lack of instruction on the internet was, was pretty bad. So I put this video series together, summing up all the knowledge I had accumulated. And like you say, similar to the videos that I make nowadays, um, basically just putting together hard to find information into one convenient source is really what it's all about. Also, it's fun to imagine the parallel universe in which I became a cake decorating person instead of an engineer. <laughs> So then in 2011, I uploaded the video that I consider the, the formal start of this channel, uh, in which I showed my home-built scanning electron microscope. So this is a really fun project. At the time, I was working for myself, so this shop was my main place of business, and I was building like MRI-compatible tools at the time, so it was really easy for me to take time off because I was my own boss and I could just decide to take the week off and work on the scanning electron microscope instead. Um, so given that flexibility, I thought it would be fun to do an impressive project. And at the time, Maker Faire was a really great way to show off cool stuff. Like the whole point of Maker Faire back in those days was just to, just to show people something interesting that you've been working on. And I, you know, it's a little bit competitive and that's great. It makes people sort of, you know, push themselves a little bit harder. And I thought, well, I want to come up with something impressive, so I'll build an electron microscope. And I did, and it, it works. It's, it actually does produce images. The magnification is not amazing. In fact, it's actually lower than some optical microscopes. But the method does work, and the whole point, again, was just to sort of show people the process, um, you know, difficulties in handle materials, basically just get down to the nitty gritty, not just show it off, but to actually show off the difficulty and the interest in sort of building it. Um, it's really all about the process rather than creating an electron microscope. Building this electron microscope had a tremendous impact on my career. Um, it did generate quite a bit of interest. Like I say, I anticipated some amount of you know, fanfare, but it, it really was quite a bit larger than I thought. And in a way, it led to the channel becoming um, legitimate. So at the time, you know, I had you know, a few thousand subscribers or something like that. And the electron microscope was really the, the formal beginning of applied science. Um, there were magazine articles I was featured in you know, various books and media outlets and stuff. And it eventually made way to all the, the really good job offers that I've gotten over the years. And um, when people ask me for career advice, I always tell them, well, I don't tell them build an electron microscope, but build something that's interesting or shows off your skills in an interesting way. Basically, having a portfolio is a super important way to um, just show people what you're up to. 
A little bit later that year, I uploaded a two-part series on transcranial magnetic stimulation. So this sounds very um, weird. Well, it is pretty weird, but also I had experience with this from doing my job in the MRI field. So if you're studying brain function, one of the things you can do is put someone into an MRI scanner and then actually stimulate their brain with this magnetic device and then use the MRI machine to see how the brain reacts to that stimulation. Also, you can just use this as a clinical treatment for depression. You can just stimulate someone's brain and not use an MRI scanner at all, just as sort of a, a treatment effect. Uh, but the idea is very simple. You just get a huge capacitor bank and empty it through a coil that you have positioned on the person's head. And the rapidly changing magnetic field basically creates a transformer. And the secondary coil of this transformer is your brain tissue because it's salt water, it's conductive. Um, it's safer than people think. Single pulses are not, have been studied very carefully and you're, you're very, very unlikely to have lasting effects from single pulses. If you do repetitive pulses, like as I mentioned, this depression treatment thing, yeah, that, that is intended to have permanent effects. But single pulses of just, you know, zapping the brain in one specific spot is unlikely to have any permanent change. So I showed this video on my channel and one of the little party tricks you can do with this is to stimulate the motor cortex. And so as you know, the, the right hemisphere of your brain controls the left half of the body. So if you're stimulating the right half of the brain and your left arm twitches, that means you know you're stimulating cortical tissue because it's flipped. Um, you'll feel all kinds of other peripheral nerve stimulation, your eyebrows will twitch and all kinds of other stuff. But if it's on the same side of the body that the stimulation is happening, you know that's not cortical stimulation because it doesn't have the flipping. So anyway, I, since making this video, I have gotten a lot of requests from people who want to build home-built TMS, um, thinking that they'll be able to treat themselves, which probably is not such a great idea. Um, I don't advocate like, you know, self-medical treatment quite like that, but um, for playing around with single pulses and stuff, it's, it's plenty fine. Also in that year, uh, the channel Periodic Videos made by Brady Heron was gaining quite a lot of popularity. And in one of those videos, the professor shows a chamber holding supercritical CO2. And I thought that was just the coolest thing ever, actually watching like a chamber of liquid like disappear right before your eyes. Like I wanted to see that, I'd never seen that before. So I wanted to build a chamber and play around with it and then also make like higher quality video. Um, the stuff that was in Brady's video, you know, back in those days, having a nice camera and a great setup was not um, given and everything. So I thought having some close up video of this water, or, I mean, liquid CO2 vaporizing would be plenty cool. So I built this chamber and this also became kind of one of my calling cards. I'd bring this little chamber to various, you know, conferences and, and hangout groups and everything. And doing a phase change in front of everyone became one of the party tricks that I was known for. Also, you may have seen this chamber live again. In fact, it's, uh, it's making the rounds and it even ended up on Niall Red's channel uh, very recently where he did a, um, a whole bunch of super critical stuff. And so uh, it's, it's back with me now. He actually sent it back to me after he's done with it. And uh, it can live on again in someone else's uh, demonstration. So now we come to an interesting one. At the end of 2011, I was working at Valve and doing a fair bit with augmented and virtual reality. So we were you know, very well aware of what was going on in the field. And at the time there was this news story that kept coming up about researchers putting an LED in a contact lens. And, you know, the breathless media, they were basically saying like, well, this is it. I mean, it's going to be, you know, cyber and everything. Uh, we're going to have computers in our eyeballs giving us stuff. And the purpose of me making this video showing an LED in a contact lens was to point out that that's not really like the thing that's going to click over into the, you know, augmented reality systems of the future. It's actually very easy to put a, an LED with a coil into a lens and shove the whole thing into your eye and get the LED to light up. The hard part is the optics, the processing, and especially the optics, really. So being able to make a display that sits on the eye is an entirely different order of magnitude difficult. But, you know, trying to get this through the media is, is not easy. So a lot of people missed the point of me making this video. It was actually to sort of make fun of the, the media for thinking that an LED was like the thing that was going to be, you know, the hardest part about this whole process. And um, this video also... Uh, ended up helping my career quite a bit. The folks at Google X at the time saw this and got a kick out of it because they were working on legitimate contact lens projects and very well knew the difficulty of, of getting electronics and other things into a contact lens. I've also always been interested in food, I guess going back to the cake making, but I've had videos over the years that um, 
sort of deal with the intersection of kind of the materials processing and, and food and cooking, which is kind of, you know, one version of it. And so I made a video showing how to make real pop rocks. Um, I would say at home, like a lot of these videos I say are at home because I'm doing them at home in my home shop. But a lot of people object because there's a lot of equipment involved. But anyway, um, it, this also recently got some attention. It was featured on Bon Appetit. Uh, they actually used my video as like a, um, a jumping off point to see how difficult this process was going to be. Um, the host, Claire, was aghast at how much equipment I was using and how difficult this process was going to look. But um, it, it is actually not too bad if you've got a pressure chamber and it does make sense how it works. And it's a pretty cool little thing. So I enjoyed doing it. A couple years after that, I was going to a conference in Europe and wanted to have, again, an impressive project to show off. And so at the time, everyone was doing backscatter x-ray imaging at the airports, at least in this country. So you go through this machine called a rapid scan or a rapid scan or something, and um, it would bounce x-rays off the surface of the body. And so the claim at the time was that uh, the x-ray dose was so small it wouldn't make any difference. They actually pulled all those machines out um, due to a lot of other various concerns. But anyway, I wanted to show how the whole process worked and what kind of images you could get out of this, again, in the home shop. So I built an x-ray backscatter imaging system, and my purpose was not to show if backscattered x-rays were safe or not. It was, again, just to sort of show the details of the process. What do you actually need to get this thing done? And what's the minimal amount of hardware you need to get an image? And sort of make the video funny, I, I dressed up a frozen chicken with a little sweater and put something metal under the sweater. And yeah, you can see it very easily. I mean, with a home-built imager, it's, it's quite easy to see something that dramatic. As a follow-on with the same x-ray tube and everything else, I realized I could also build a CT scanner. And so it makes really cool images. And also talking about the algorithm that goes from the flat 2D images that a camera gets and reconstructing that into 3D was also a pretty cool process. Uh, making use of, of open source code. I, I certainly am not a master of the algorithms, and so it was very nice that someone else had come up with this uh, cone beam backscattering uh, reconstruction algorithm. At that same conference, the exceptionally hard and soft meeting in Europe, I learned about this beer that was being sort of experimented on on the public, I would say. Like they would try a different batch, a different recipe, and then see if the feedback was good or not and sort of adjust their batch in real time or adjust their running recipe in real time. And so I thought, oh, wouldn't that be cool if you scaled it down to like the individual beer or, or maybe I, I chose cookies in this case. So I built a machine that would make a different recipe for every cookie on the sheet so you could experiment very rapidly. Uh, the downside of cookie batches is that you'd have to make like a whole sheet of them with one variation and then you'd have to eat all of them or give them all away or something to see you know, to, to get to the next iteration. So wouldn't it be nice if you could just try things rapidly? So the idea was, how do you dispense tiny amounts of ingredients uh, in a carefully, in a very accurate way so that you can have different batches? And so I built this cookie machine and it was a slight um, change in format for my channel too. I've been experimenting with different sort of formats on the channel. And this one was a little bit more, you know, cinematic. And I had maybe five or six videos kind of concentrating on this project. And I would say it wasn't received super well. I think the, the channel works best in sort of 10 to 20 minute videos where it's just focused on a topic. And this sort of drawn out kind of, you know, progress tracking video where it's like cookie machine number six or whatever. I, it just didn't fit with, you know, the viewership or even me that well. But I did like the project. And this one also went to Maker Faire. And um, I think it would be rather cool to scale this up at the commercial level. Like you could have... Imagine you buy a cookie and it has like a QR code and you scan it and tell them if you think that cookie was any good or not. As a business, you could try all kinds of experiments in real time and figure out what the best recipes are. Although one thing I learned from this process is that if you buy like, you know, a, a bag of Toll House chocolate morsels, the recipe that's on the back of that thing has been perfected over, you know, hundreds of years. And so it's already pretty darn good. And it's true there might be some variation between some people like them really chewy and some people like them a little more cakey or whatever. Um, it's still pretty darn good to start with. And so it's hard to kind of improve on it. But anyway, I, I liked the idea. And I think there's a lot of, you know, interesting stuff that could happen with customization and food and, and robotics in the future. Another one of my favorite difficult projects was building an LCD essentially from scratch. I didn't make the liquid crystal from scratch. I, I Someone actually donated it very thankfully, but making the patterned glass and putting it all together and getting it to work. As you can see, I was still working at Valve at the time. 
And uh, I just really enjoyed the process of researching the whole thing. It used um, my, my sputtering and physical vapor deposition setup, and I was controlling the thicknesses. It just involved a lot of like careful work. And I was kind of marching towards this idea where I would eventually make an OLED. I really wanted to make an active light emitting display and getting some of the process under control um, with just a plain old LCD is, is easier. Then we come to the video in which I took a vinyl LP, a record, and put it into the scanning electron microscope. Not my own SEM. By this time, someone else had donated a scanning electron microscope to the channel. So I was able to use a commercial SEM to get, you know, high quality images. But I consider this little animation of the needle in the, in the groove probably one of the best overall things that I've ever made. Um, it attracted quite a bit of attention. It's probably my most viewed video, or at least it was for a very long time. And um, I've received tons and tons of requests, mostly from media outlets that want to use my footage for free. But still, it's nice to know that people, you know, want to see this thing and think that it's visually captivating. Um, in sort of true form on Hacker News, one of the top criticisms was that it's not dynamic. It doesn't actually show the needle bouncing like it would in real time because it's a stop motion animation. So you can always count on Hacker News to give you that, that reality slap in the face. And then finally, I wanted to pick a recent video. I've been talking about older videos since, you know, a lot of you folks have probably been watching for a while and know my recent stuff. I thought I'd go into the past to show some of the earlier things. But by far, one of my favorite videos from recent is this silicon etching video. This had to be one of the coolest things that I had just ever heard of in years and years, right? Like the, the number of connections made in this process is astounding. You take like an electrical waveform and you program the material by like, you know, time varying the waveform into the material, etching it as you go. And then that waveform affects light, which is another waveform, and it's all connected with Fourier transforms. It's really one of the most mind-blowing sort of number of connections that you can get in one process. And it's also cool that you don't need that much weird equipment. I mean, really just a time-controlled power supply and some of this hydrofluoric acid, which is another favorite that shows up on the channel. Um, and the, the result is visually striking, so it's especially good for the video format where you need something that's fun to look at. So I, I know I left a lot out since there's 250 videos. Um, if there's like, you know, viewer suggestions, maybe we'll do another one of these and put up like viewer favorites or something, and I'll give you all the backstory on those videos as well. There, there could be some hidden gems in there, you never know. All right, well, I hope you found that interesting, and I'll see you next time. Bye.